SUVs and crossovers have permeated so highly in the automotive world that even brands like Aston Martin, Lamborghini, and soon Ferrari will be selling SUVs of their own. But not McLaren. McLaren wants to rest on its laurels and say we will never build an SUV. That's just not the type of company we are and it would go against our brand heritage, which is why they've introduced this latest model, the GT. Now, GT means Grand Tourer. So they built this car to be more practical and more livable than any McLaren previously. Now, today we're gonna talk about how this car does as a supercar and how it does as a GT, as an everyday car. So let's see what the McLaren GT is all about. We're gonna start off as we always do by checking out the exterior of the McLaren GT. This is very important when you're shopping for supercars, it's gotta be a good looking car. And when McLaren first launched this car, I wasn't super impressed with the styling. It's definitely the more plain car in their lineup. It's a little softer, it's a little taller, you can see it's a little more squared off. Of course, that's a nod to practicality. But then they dropped this particular one off in this Ludus blue paint job and wow, the color just absolutely makes this. I took this to a Cars and Coffee, which was full of other supercars supercars and people could not stop staring at this paint, although it will cost you 7,500 bucks to get. I think this is the best color I've seen on this car. The front end is a little more plain compared to other McLarens, um, and it's a little unfortunate that after this car came out, the C8 Corvette came out. I think that the two look a little similar in the front. Of course, this is a little more rounded, and I do think this is overall the prettier appearance here. We've got the 20 spoke wheels. There are a bunch of wheel options you can get. I absolutely absolutely love these. You can get them in all black as well. Below them, we have the optional carbon ceramic brakes. Those are about a $6,000 option as well. And you can tell that this is longer than any other previous McLaren. The wheelbase is about 184 inches, meaning that it's still shorter than like an Aston Martin DBS or a Bentley Continental GT. It's actually based on the 720S platform, but they just lengthened that a little bit to make it a little more comfortable and to give you more storage space. Now that we come back here, it's very simple. It kind of looks like a Lamborghini Huracan to me, at least back here, at least in terms of simplicity. I love the fact that the taillights are just these little slits of LED light. The best angle to me of this car is the straight rear visibility. And McLaren really marketed this car from the front when they first started sending out press pictures. And I think that did the car a little bit of disjustice. The booty is where this car really shines, especially in this Lotus blue paint job. And if you really want for an extra $500, you can even have the key to match. So before we get onto the inside, I wanna mention getting in and out of this vehicle because McLaren wants you to drive this car every day, but unfortunately, due to the amazingly cool doors and the low sill, getting in and out is not so elegant. You kinda of have to just put one foot in, drop yourself in onto the bulkhead here, and then lower yourself in. And then once you're in, it's really not so hard to grab the doors. The handles are reasonably within reach if you have like a decent arm length. Uh, I'm not a super tall guy, and then you just bring the doors down they are very light and they do soft close here and then once you're in it's actually quite comfortable McLaren's base seats here are not very like padded they're not very cushy but they are contoured in such a way that it does feel really comfortable once you're in here and this cabin of the GT is definitely the most livable that McLaren has ever made there's little storage spaces everywhere we've got a little bit of storage here on the door I've got a little leather pouch ahead of me here We've got our cup holder here with two extra here. I love the phone slots here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my phone right here and if I stick it right there, you see that perfectly houses two people's phones. So I love how McLaren has done that. However, on the CarBuzz cup holder index, this car is going to score just a one out of five because that's how many cup holders it has that are actually usable. You can see my Yeti fits here just fine, my big Yeti here, but if I ever tried to stick it or in fact pretty much anything else under here you see it's going to bump this infotainment system so it doesn't score too highly on that we also have a shockingly usable armrest here it's not the biggest but you can fit your wallet keys other things like that speaking of which we've got our 
lovely lotus blue uh, key here so I can go ahead and stick that away for safekeeping and as we talk about the rest of the car here. So the interior is covered in leather. We've got leather on the seats, leather on the dash. We have the Lux spec of this car. It costs um, I think about $10,000 more than a base McLaren GT. You get power adjustable seats which the controls are a little bit annoying but they are memory so it pulls the seat back as far as it goes to make it a little bit easier to get in and out of and then you just pull this stock and then it'll bring everything closer to you uh, so you're in position that's nice we've got the Bowers and Wilkins audio system as well 12 speakers in this cabin uh, so if you are just cruising on like a long distance journey these sound incredible they are such a nice uh, speaker system McLaren's infotainment system is housed here on this screen here. You push this to be taken to your home menu. You can have navigation, audio, things like that. The nav system is actually decently quick and easy to use. I think they've improved the processing power. This is definitely the quickest and most snappy that I've experienced in a McLaren vehicle. Um, but it doesn't have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, and I've noticed a little bit of Bluetooth wonkiness with it. But everything you basically need is there. Uh, we've got this very wonderful steering wheel. McLaren hasn't bothered giving it all sorts of crazy controls like Ferrari does. There are no buttons on the steering wheel. You just get these two very large, very metal paddle shifters that are actually connected. So you see if I pull the downshift one, this one actually moves with it. So if I wanted to upshift, I could push on this paddle as well. These click so fabulously. I love clicking these. It's absolutely great. And I love the steering wheel as well. Now, uh, in terms of airiness, the cabin feels very airy. There's glass everywhere, big windshield. I love the electrochromic roof. You can push these buttons. So as you can see, I have it in its uh, brightest setting to let in the most sun, but I can cycle through different modes here to make it more opaque. And if I go to the most opaque setting, you can see it really doesn't let in that much sun. So if you are getting cooked on a hot day, you can push that and cycle between those modes. That's really cool. We have our drive modes down here. There's two of them that you're going to want to focus on to actually activate them, you push this button that says active, that's going to activate these systems. We have a dial here for handling. You can go from comfort, sport to track with the ESC off that disables your traction control. And over here we have our powertrain controls. Same thing, comfort, sport, track, and if I push this it's going to put the transmission into its manual mode. We've also got our launch controls, our auto start, stop, defeat, and we can put it into gear. We have neutral, reverse, and drive. There's no park, you're going to have to activate the e-brake. And the last thing I want to talk about in terms of practicality for this vehicle is the vehicle nose lift. It's on this stock right here. You just tap it and it will lift up the front of the end of the vehicle. That is highly important when you're driving a low slung supercar like this so that you do not scrape it. Continuing with our theme of this being a quote usable supercar, let's go ahead and check out the trunk space, or in this case, the frunk space. In the front here, we've got 5.3 cubic feet of space, which is reasonable for one of these mid-engine supercars. If you have like a deeper object, you can see I have our camera case here, fits in just fine there. Um, so not much else to say about this space here. Most supercars have their trunks up here, but the McLaren GT is just a little bit different because we have additional storage space out back. The GT is unlike a lot of other supercars because back here we've got some storage space, 14.8 cubic feet of it to be exact. So combined with the 5.3 that you get up front, you get 20.1 cubic feet of space, which is technically massive for a supercar like this. It actually even trumps GT cars like the Bentley Continental GT and Aston Martin DB11. But I'm afraid the storage space back here is somewhat limited because of the shape. You've got the 4.0 liter V8 engine sitting under here. So as you can see, that comes up very high. So the only deep spaces that you have here are right here in the back and then up front, which you can access by folding the seats forward just a little bit. Now that creates a, a problem. If you have long, low objects, it will work fine. Or you can possibly fit about this size of a backpack right here in the back portion without the hatch giving you too much trouble, but it's not the most usable space. And 
then when you go ahead and open it, you're gonna be happy about this material here. It's called super fabric, McLaren calls it. It's NASA inspired, heat resistant, which is good so you don't have the heat from the engine burning everything that you put back here. It's water resistant too, because I noticed when you open this up when it's been wet, all the water will drip down on your backpack, whatever you have in here. So that's just a little bit annoying. But I will say that McLaren has at least maximized trunk space as much as it can. And this is one of the more usable supercars, probably the most usable supercar that money can buy. All right, so now that we've gone through all the practical considerations of the McLaren GT, it's time for the all-important segment of how it drives, but we do have to start that on a practical note as well because this is the McLaren that you will maybe be driving every day. So let's talk about how comfortable it is. So McLaren has independent adaptive suspension on each wheel, which smooths out the ride when you're driving at high speeds. You will notice that this is still a supercar when you're driving it over like slow stuff, cobblestones, things like that, you're still gonna be a little bit jittery. But in its most comfortable settings, it really doesn't punish you. You never go over a bump and go, oh, that hurt my back. You never really feel like that. And in the comfort powertrain mode, the engine is pretty quiet. It doesn't really drone at all. The transmission, the seven-speed dual clutch, is so smooth that honestly, it shifts like a CVT in a good way. You will hear the engine change ratios, but you won't actually feel it change gears. That's indicative of a really good DCT. And you can definitely tell that they've added a ton of sound deadening to this car. So you don't hear like little leaves and little rocks like tinking uh, on the wheel wells of this car. So in terms of it being a comfortable cruiser, it definitely is more livable than any other McLaren previously. But how does it do on the fun stuff? So I'm gonna push the active button and I'm gonna put both of the powertrain and the handling settings into the sport mode. And let's see how it does as a sports car. Ready? Oh boy. Oh, it's fast. This car will do zero to 60 in just 3.1 seconds, zero to 124 miles an hour in nine seconds, and you will be completing the quarter mile in 11 seconds flat. That's pretty quick for a GT car, and I'm just in the sport mode right now. We've got 612 horsepower coming from that four liter twin turbo V8, 465 pound-feet of torque. It's the same engine you actually get in the 720. It makes a lot less power because the turbos are smaller on this model, and then McLaren says, that's gonna give this car better low end usability. Of course, it's gonna sacrifice a little bit on the high end, but I'm telling you, when you're in the right gear on this car, oh boy, it hits turbo mode, oh my God. That engine just makes spaceship levels of whooshiness. It just pins you back in your seat like crazy. This is so fast. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in its race mode now. You can hear it. Oh my God. The brakes are carbon ceramics on this one. Very heavy brake pedal feel as all McLarens have. You really have to slam on the brakes and you'll notice this in traffic. Just to keep the car stopped, you have to be pretty firm on the pedal, pretty firm on the gas too. You can tell I've taken manual control of the transmission. It shifts like lightning. Shift. Shift, oh, oh, oh my God, it shifts faster than I can even think. Oh, these paddles, listen to that downshift. It just cracks like a whip. It's incredible, I love the way it sounds. The steering, we gotta talk about the steering on this model. It's hydraulic. A lot of manufacturers, including Porsche, have switched over to electric steering, but not McLaren. They've still stuck with a hydraulic unit. The way that I'm gonna try to explain it to you is like riding a bicycle. Remember the last time you rode a bike as a kid and you went over some really bumpy stuff, maybe some train tracks, and you felt every vibration through the handlebars? That's what this steering feels like. If I go over an imperfect road, it vibrates every bit of it to me through the steering wheel. It is 
the best steering I've ever felt on a car, bar none. And I've driven cars with manual steering, but this is just absolute pure perfection. And now that we're in this race mode, it definitely firms up the car. You can tell that everything becomes a lot stiffer. There's zero body roll in this mode. I'm gonna push through here. Oh my gosh, the steering is absolutely telepathic. It feels like I'm sitting on the front axle. Now there is a little bit more body roll than what you get in a 720S. It just sits higher up. You're not gonna be able to prevent that, but I promise you that it doesn't ruin the experience whatsoever. And the thing that I wanna to mention to you is, I'm gonna take it now out of manual mode here because this is an important distinction to make. If you watched my video of the Nissan R35 GTR Nismo, please watch that video if you haven't. I explained that the transmission, which is also a dual clutch, wasn't my favorite because it just didn't feel responsive enough to me. In its raciest setting, it wouldn't downshift quickly. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually put this back into its normal powertrain setting. So it's gonna shift up a couple of gears to me. And I want to explain to you the absolute brilliance, the real magic that McLaren brings to the table with this seven speed dual clutch transmission is the cleverness of the program. So right now we're cruising along, we're in fifth gear, and oh, I need to make a pass, but I don't really feel like pulling the paddles. It just doesn't come to my head. I wanna make a pass right now. What's gonna happen when I put my foot on the gas? Watch this. It's gonna downshift quickly. Oh, oh, oh and we're gone. I just haven't driven a car that responds with the quickness that this car responds with to just instantly go down gears. Like it doesn't just go seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. It goes seven, three, like as quickly as you can possibly blink. It just makes all maneuvers in this car an absolute breeze. So in terms of the dynamics of this car, because as we've seen in this video, I think the McLaren GT gets maybe like a C grade in terms of livability every day, but in terms of how it drives, I think it is a little bit more pure than an NSX or an R8 or those types of cars. It definitely drives better than say an Aston Martin DBS, uh, DB11 or Bentley Continental GT. These are just nowhere near that aggressive. And if I drive it normally, I've been averaging about 11 miles per gallon uh, since we set off. But if I go to my long-term stats, I'm getting about 17 miles per gallon. McLaren says you'll get 15 MPG in the city, 21 on the highway and 17 combined. But I've actually hypermiled one of these and you can definitely get it into the mid 20s on MPG. So it is livable. You crank up the Bowers and Wilkins, put everything in comfort mode, and you theoretically could drive this on a long journey. As long as you have the matched luggage set and you have everything fitting in, your hands are gonna hurt a little bit after a while with this vibrating steering, but this is definitely the most comfortable McLaren ever, but it still feels like a McLaren. So that was the 2020 McLaren GT. Pricing starts at $210,000. This one you see as tested is about $263,000 and obviously the prices range heavily depending on options. So let's summarize what we found out about this car in terms of how it does as a GT and how it does as a supercar, covering the supercar stuff first. It is still a McLaren. It still has the best steering I think I've ever felt in a supercar. The engine is spectacular. The transmission might be better. It's still very comfortable though. And this is by far the most comfortable McLaren that I have ever driven. It's softer, it's quieter on the inside. And when you compare it to other supercars like the Audi R8, NSX, even compared to the Bentley Continental GT and the Aston Martin DBS, the storage space is a lot better on this car. But as I showed you, it's still not that usable. There are some annoying things to it. It still sits low. It's still stiff like a supercar, so it's not super cushy to take on long distances. The steering will still shake your hands out of their sockets and crush your bones. So it just doesn't feel like a car that I would drive every day. I think I would still rather have the Bentley or the Aston Martin. But if you are cross shopping this car with like an R8 or an NSX, I do think it does live up to the level of comforts of those cars. And it definitely sets out and succeeds in McLaren's goals of making their most comfortable and most usable car ever. 
We really hope you've enjoyed this review of the 2020 McLaren GT. For more of our content, be sure to check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and of course, the CarBuzz app on your iOS or Android device. We also have a TikTok where you'll see videos like ones of this McLaren GT. And as always, be sure to like and hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to be alerted of our latest videos. I'll see you next time.